I guess you're all preparing for Father's Day this coming weekend. So, I'm sure you're expecting a Father's Day story from me. Now, keep in mind that I did a Father's Day story last year. So, if you want to refresh, refresh your memory on that one, you can go back and it's just entitled Another Father's Day. It's a good story. You'll like it. It's funny. So, several of you have inquired about my dad because I always talked about my mother, what she did. But there were reasons for being able to talk about my mother because she was there every day, seven days a week. My dad was not. My dad's job took him away from home five days a week, and he came home on Friday night, left out early Monday morning for his job. So we didn't have to put up with Daddy during the week, but we sure did have to put up with Mama and her threats of Daddy. She was good at trying to scare us when we weren't doing things right. There was always, you just wait till your Daddy gets home. If your daddy finds out what you did today, those were the things we always heard about daddy. Daddy was a private man. He never talked about his family. He was the youngest of 11 children. He was 14 years old when he was orphaned. His mother had died when he was a baby, but he had a stepmother. She was the mother to him. When his dad died, he and his stepmother could not run the farm. They weren't capable of running a big farm. So what would they do? His stepmother's name was Nancy. She'd been married twice before. Now all three husbands had died. She never had any children. What was she going to do for support? What was my dad going to do? 14 years old. His school career ended in the eighth grade. He had to get a job. So he went to live with his sister, older sister, Margaret. And he stayed with her until he got a job working for the railroad, LN Railroad. 15 years old, he lied about his age because that's the only way they would hire him. He was too young. Up until that time, my Uncle John, the oldest of the 11 children, he was 26 years older than my dad. But he was married, had children of his own older than my dad. But he was there to help take care of him. My dad worked for him and with him at the, what they called the Iron Furnace in Cumberland Gap, Tennessee. Iron Furnace was a big business. The small community down in the middle of the mountains. Everything was going well. They had a big hotel there. My Aunt Minerva ran the hotel. And you had these drummers. Traveling salesmen were called drummers. They would come in on the train. The train stopped right by the tunnel. That's where the train station was. And one of Uncle John's oldest boys would be there to meet the train with his wagon. He would haul the drummers, bags, and luggage to the hotel for a nickel. My dad helped Uncle John search for um, metal, any kind of metal, any kind of iron product and they'd haul them to the iron furnace. 
where they would get paid. Now, by the time he was 19, my dad had married my mother. Pat wouldn't let my mother go. No way was he taking my mother away from the farm. So they eloped. And they started their own family. At first they were living in the cabin where my dad was born. That was in Frog Level. Have you ever heard of Frog Level? That's my favorite name. And so they lived there for a while and they lived through the 1918 influenza epidemic. My dad was a man that never missed a day's work. Always was there. They were in the log cabin at that time. So many sick people, so many people dying. And there was my mother, my dad, and my oldest sister was two years old. And mama was pregnant with her second child ready to be born anytime soon. There they all were in bed. Mama couldn't do anything. Daddy couldn't help her. So my grandfather and my uncle were the only two in this large family that had not contracted the flu epidemic. They went from house to house making soup just so the families would have something to eat. They brought in firewood so that they could keep warm in those pot-bellied stoves and, and the old fireplaces. That's the only time my dad missed work. He was too ill. They all overcame the epidemic and daddy quit working for the railroad and went to work for himself. He became a contractor. He built houses, schools, churches, courthouses. He built bridges, sidewalks, streets. There wasn't anything he couldn't build, which took him away from home a lot. These were not local jobs. You had to bid on most of those jobs during that time period. And he was away from home five days a week. Came home Friday night, left out again on Monday morning for his job. He was the boss. Now, while Daddy was gone, Mama was in charge. Mama handled the pocketbook, the finances, she paid all the bills. And what we always thought was funny was Daddy was a contractor building all of these things. And while he's away at work, Mama's calling a plumber to come and take care of the plumbing problem. Mama's calling an electrician to take care of the the wiring in the house. Any repairs that had to be done, Mama was hiring someone to do these things. And here was my daddy, building houses, building churches, building everything, but he was never at home to take care of his own house. We used to kid about that a lot. So, my sister and I as teenagers, in the summertime, we were out in the sun wearing shorts and halters. Now girls, you know what I'm talking about, those cute little halters and those short shorts. We were pretty, yeah, we liked how we looked in those, but we would lie in the sun every day to get a good tan. We used tea to rub on our skin. We'd fix some tea on the stove and we'd take that tea water 
and that would help darken our skin because we didn't tan too well. Friday night would come. Oh my gosh. Daddy's home. We could see his pickup truck coming out the road. We hightailed it inside the house. We put on a skirt. We put on a blouse. We got picked up because Daddy would throw a fit if he walked in the door and saw us girls wearing nothing but a pair of shorts and a halter. Oh, yeah. He was very picky about those things. And when he was home, we minded our P's and Q's, let me tell you. We were, we didn't slam the screen door every time we went in and out the door when Daddy was home. We minded our manners. When supper time came, Daddy came to the table. We were there, all of us. There was no asking, where's so-and-so? Why isn't she here? We were there. We knew Daddy was strict. He had his own rules, but still Mama took care of the household and she took care of us kids. The punishment all came from her, but the threats included Daddy. That was how she could get to us, was to say, wait till your Daddy finds out. Sunday mornings, oh, you wouldn't believe. When there's four or five kids in the house, mom and daddy. Now, you didn't have houses with two bathrooms in those days. We were lucky to have one bathroom. And we had to take turns. I can't even begin to describe what it was like on Sunday morning when all of us girls were trying to get in the bathroom. But I tell you, the king of the house got it in first. That was daddy. We didn't argue about whose turn it was. We'd stand in the little hall behind each other. And as soon as one came out, the other one grabbed the door and went in the bathroom. But if daddy was in line, he got the first pickings. Now, it could be a rigmarole in our house on Sunday morning. We're getting ready to go to church. And you don't know what's going to happen next because we all wanted in the bathroom at the same time. When Daddy got in the car, started up that engine, you better be in the back seat. And I know Mama used to tell me that my Brother Bug, the one that was killed in World War II, he had a paper route. And, of course, you had to deliver the papers early on Sunday morning. And Daddy would say, young man, you be here back to the house when we get ready to leave for church. Well, sometimes my brother didn't make it. So for punishment... Daddy would put him in the bathroom while we all went to church. He had to stay locked in the bathroom. But during those days, Mama didn't go to church every Sunday. She she stayed home. She was always there to cook dinner because we had big dinner on Sunday. That's when you had your fried chicken. That's when we had the banana pudding. That's when we had the big meal. So she had to stay home and prepare that stuff. So... After Daddy would drive off in the car with the rest of us kids, my brother, Mama would go to the bathroom, unlock the bathroom door, and my brother. The funny thing about that was he was very musical. He could play instruments, he played his guitar, played the harmonica. Um, he would sing. He, he was very talented. What Daddy thought was punishment for him by locking him in the bathroom, my brother would sit in there with his harmonica and he would play his harmonica. That's what he liked to do anyway. That's what he would be doing anyway. He used to go up on top of the hill 
or a big tree up there he could climb up on one of those limbs. He'd take his guitar with him. He'd take his harmonica with him. And he'd be skipping school, sitting on a tree limb, singing and playing his guitar. Nobody knew where he was. Truant officers out looking for him. Couldn't find him. All his friends knew where he was, but Mama didn't know, and the truant officer didn't know. So that's how my brother got by with not having to go to church on Sundays. I'm getting the hiccups. So anyway, that's about him. We're talking about my daddy. When aunts and uncles would come on weekend to visit, of course, Mama cooked a big meal, and they loved to come to our house because they knew they were going to be well-fed. And after dinner on Sunday, Daddy would stay in the kitchen with the men and my cousins, who were all older than I was. And that's the only time I remember my father opening up and talking about himself and talking about his childhood. He would start telling a story and he would get so tickled and he would laugh so hard and my mother would have to tell him, slow down, slow down. You're gonna have a stroke. She, that was her answer to everything. You're gonna have a stroke. But I would sit just in the dining room. They'd be in the kitchen. And I loved hearing my daddy telling his stories because they were all so funny. And he would start coughing. He would laugh so hard. And everybody would be laughing. But other than that, he never spoke of his sisters, his brothers, his parents. I know nothing about those people. And as a kid, I wasn't interested. I've always regretted that I didn't sit down and ask my dad questions. Daddy, what did you do? What kind of school did you go to? Why did you have to drop out in the eighth grade? Where did you work when your when your dad died? One of the story, one of the things he did tell. His grandfather, George Washington Nevels, prominent man in the community. He owned twelve hundred acres of farmland. His house was like one of those southern plantation houses. At Christmas, he would gather all of his children in. When I say children, he was married twice. When my great-grandmother died, he remarried shortly after. She had had eight children. My great-grandmother, my grandmother, actually, was one of those eight children. And then he had 11 more by his second wife, 19 children he raised. At Christmas, they all came to Grandpa's house to get their Christmas gift. Everybody got $100. That's a lot of money back before, right around 1900. That was a lot of money, especially when you had that many children. And Daddy would walk, I don't know how many miles. I get it confused. He either walked three miles or he walked 13 miles to get his mother's share of the Christmas gifts. 
Grandpa didn't help. He didn't help him. He didn't take him in. He stayed with his Aunt Margaret. I mean, his sister Margaret. I say aunt because she was my aunt. And she worked in carnivals. That shocked the living daylights out of me when Mama told me, your Aunt Margaret worked in carnivals. She sold uh, candy. What is it? What am I trying to say? Cotton candy. She made cotton candy. We're talking about 1910, 113 years ago. And I was totally shocked when Mama told me that. So, I remember when my sister was courting, she always had a boyfriend in high school. She was a pretty girl. She had a beautiful voice. She sang for every funeral and wedding and activity that took place in town. She always had a boyfriend. But she had one boyfriend that none of us liked. Daddy didn't like him. And when he would be at the house and my sister would see Daddy's car coming or his truck, whichever one he was driving. Daddy didn't like this boyfriend and she had to get him out of the house. He didn't go out the front door. He went out the back door. Down the steps, across the field to the next street before Daddy got there. Because my sister was afraid what Daddy might say to him. Even so, they were the kind of couple that the minute he got home, he had to call back and talk to my sister. They couldn't be away from each other hardly any time at all. And if Daddy was home when the phone rang, he was a big man. But you should have seen him making a dash for the telephone to get there first before my sister got there because we all know who was calling. It was always her boyfriend. Now this boyfriend, he wasn't the prettiest thing you ever saw. I don't know any way to describe him except to say, do you remember Ichabod Crane? The legend of Sleepy Hollow. You remember what Ichabod Crane looked like? That's the only way I know to describe this boyfriend. He had big ears too. Daddy would get to the telephone, pick it up. Of course, it was her boyfriend. And my dad would stand there with the phone right by his face. And he'd yell with my sister standing there looking at him. He would yell, sis, spider legs want to talk to you. That would just tickle me to death when he did that. And he got the biggest kick out of doing that because he didn't like this kid. And my sister was fit to be tied. But we were all laughing. That was always so funny when Daddy could get to the phone before she did. Spider legs want to talk to you. Yeah, that's just about what it looked like, spider legs. Now, one time, Daddy came home. 
This was a period when the girls were using peroxide on their hair. She had light brown hair, natural curly, and it she parted on one side and it will lay in deep waves all the way down. Of course, we all had long hair back, back then. She took the peroxide and she started from back here to here, this one side of her hair was platinum blonde. Daddy came home from work that weekend. He was standing in the kitchen. She walked in, he looked at her. He, it was like he was stoned. He looked at her and he started rubbing his hands. And he said, if I had a pair of scissors, I'd cut it to the scalp. She hit the back door. It's a wonder she hadn't gone through the door without opening it first. She knew Daddy meant what he said. She went out that back door, down those steps, across the field, and she stayed gone till it got dark and she could come home and flip in the bedroom where Daddy couldn't see her. That's one time she did scare him. Daddy saw her with that platinum blonde streak down the side of her head. She never did that again. Now let's see. Daddy being a builder, being a contractor, we were going to the church downtown, the biggest church in town, which was the Baptist church. And Daddy had retired. The pastor of the church was somehow related to my dad. Sweetest man you ever met and the funniest man you ever met. He came to my dad and said, we need a new church on Park Hill. Would you be willing to build us a church. So my dad did. He built a church. Now, another thing about my father, he was well read in the Bible. He understood the scripture like nobody you ever knew before. Self-taught. I never understood how how he could understand what those scriptures meant. Nobody really could teach Revelation because they didn't understand it themselves. But Daddy did. And when Sunday school lessons around town in their Sunday school quarterlies was from the book of Revelation, oh my, People dreaded because they, they didn't really know how to explain it. But I remember I was in high school. And people from the Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, whatever church around town, they went to Park Hill to listen to my dad teach revelations and one of the deacons said he know more he knows more about the bible than any man i've ever seen coming out of the seminary he has a natural understanding of the scriptures 
I was pretty proud of my dad then. And he did. He taught himself. He was a smart man, ordinary in his overall, those blue railroad shirts he'd wear on the job. But he was a very intelligent man. Simple man, simple. He always wanted to, he wanted to garden like he'd had when he was a kid. Always dreamed of having that garden. So he bought a little farm, 20 acres. He had 20, had 20 cows on the acre. Now, those acres. Now, you think about that. The last time he'd ever worked on a farm was when he was 13 years old, and now he's retired. And he thinks he's going to be a farmer? Well, he had uh, tenants on the farm that took care of the cows. The cows had names. He gave them names. Yeah, that was my dad. And every morning he'd get up, put on his work clothes, get in his pickup truck, and off he went down to the farm where he could work with his cows. He enjoyed that thoroughly. Now, one of the things about my dad was he never went shopping downtown in uh, J.C. Penney, Belks, those stores downtown. He never bought his own shoes. He never bought his own clothes. My mother did that. She would go pick the things out. And when he came home on the weekend, he would try on two or three pairs of pants, two or three shirts. She'd bring home a couple of pairs of shoes. These were, were going to be his Sunday shoes. He would try them on, and whatever fit, he wasn't that particular about the colors, how they looked. Mama was the one handle that. But that's how he bought his clothes. Mama picked them out. He tried them on. What he didn't keep, she took back to the store. He was never in J.C. Penney's to shop. The only place he went was the car dealership. He would go on weekend, get his spark plug changed, and get the oil changed. And he always went to the bank on Saturday morning. As Saturday morning, the men stood out on the sidewalk spitting tobacco in the street. He was one of them. And catching up on the latest world's events. Now, I remember the day Daddy had taken his car down to the dealership. Need to get the spark plug changed. Next thing we knew, we saw this car coming out the street. Whoa! Pulled up in front of our house, and Daddy was in the driver's seat. He had bought a town and country Chrysler convertible. Do you remember the days when those station wagons and cars had the wood panel doors? This Chrysler convertible was cream colored. It had those wood panels and to top it off, on the hood of the car were two big, long horns. You remember when the truckers used to have those big horns on the hood of their trucks? And they would beep, beep, scare you half to death. This Chrysler convertible had those horns on the hood of the car. prettiest thing you ever saw. Oh, my sister and brother and I, we were in heaven. Look, 
what we've got. Everybody in town is going to envy us. My mother just about flipped out. Daddy, that's not a family man car. As far as he was concerned, it was. As far as we kids were concerned, it was. And we could not wait to ride in that convertible with the top down. You just wait till those friends in downtown see us coming up Main Street in our town and country Chrysler convertible. That car lasted two months. Mama saw it to that. But what do you think he traded it in for? A brand new Commodore Hudson. Turquoise. There weren't any turquoise cars around in those days, but there were two in Corbin. The one my dad bought and the car dealer on the other one. Everybody knew when we were coming in that big Hudson Commodore. I hated that car because we wore those stovepipe skirts in those days, and they came about mid-calf. You had to step up and over to get into the car, you know. We couldn't step into the car because our stovepipe skirts were too tight, and we had to pull them up above our knees in order to get in the car. My sister and I fussed and cussed every time we got in the back seat of the Hudson. That car was around a long time, long time. It's a classic. It would be a classic today. Anyway, that was my daddy. That's the way he bought things. He didn't tell Mama. He'd go, like I said, he went downtown to get the spark plug chain and came back driving a Town and Country Chrysler. Wouldn't you like to have a daddy like that? <laughs> yes, we liked it. We we kids just loved it, but not Mama. Daddy bought a little farm on the other end of town. Now this is a fairy tale farm. Seven acres. It had a garden plot down in front of it. There were a couple of cows on that farm. Now, Daddy rented the house out. And he would take us kids in the pickup truck on the weekends. He put out a garden. When he'd come home on the weekends, he worked his garden. There was a strawberry patch. The lady that lived there, she'd let us pick strawberries. There were chickens and roosters. And she would take us in the house and give us a glass of ice water. We loved that little house. There seemed to be everything on that seven acres that would make a kid happy. It was like some of the Walt Disney movies when they lived on farms and there were children and there were the little lambs and things like that. We wandered all over that farm on the hillsides up where the cows were. There was an apple orchard up above. Nearby was a barn, but the thing that fascinated us most, there were two goldfish ponds. One right at the back door was a concrete pond, had a little fountain in it. Right in the middle of the yard, the prettiest green grass you ever saw. I don't think there was a weed in that grass. There was these tall bushes, thick bushes, in a circle. And my sister and I were curious. There's two big stones, like an entrance. We want to see what behind those bushes. We went through that pathway, and when we got beyond those stones 
in those bushes, there was a circular path that went around a pond. And in the middle of that pond was a fountain that flowed like an umbrella. There were morning glories and flowers, butterflies. I thought it was the prettiest thing I had ever seen and it was hidden. It was like a hidden garden. And I was fascinated with it. Prettiest place I'd ever seen. And that was Daddy's little farm. It was like a Walt Disney movie. One day my sister, she decided to play with the roosters. Well, that reversed itself. The roosters played with her. And she took off running like a bat out of, well, you know what I was going to say. Those roosters were right behind her. <clears throat> and all I could do was stand back and laugh. One time she got taken. It was fun. It was fun. I loved that little farm and daddy finally sold it. Those were the things he did. He bought two farms. Mama didn't know he was gonna buy a farm. He bought those new cars. What did we need with a Chrysler convertible? He was a family man. He was supposed to act like a family man. Well, in some ways he did, but he sure made us kids happy when he went out and bought those unusual things that mama didn't expect. But I can remember after I married, I moved into a new house in Lexington. We just moved in and mom and daddy were gonna come up and see my new house. I was scared. Daddy was a builder. What was he going to say? Cause this was a brand new house. And I thought, oh, he's gonna look it over and he's gonna tell me all the bad things about the house. Now I was his youngest child, youngest daughter, and he was concerned about me. So they came and what he did, he looked at that around the house. We had a basement and he left the house and started walking down the street. He walked down to the end of the street, turned, went up another street. That other street, they were building houses. So he was able to walk up and look them over. He was able to step inside where they were partially built, check, check the looks of the house, the progress they were making. And I knew he was gonna make comparisons between those houses and the one I was living in. Now we didn't have the biggest and best house in town, mind you. We were barely able to make the initial down payment on it. Daddy came back and he said, you did a good job, girl. Sis, he called me, sis. You did a good job, sis. What more could I ask for than the approval? Of my dad. He was a good man. He could tell you anything you wanted to know about the Bible. And this was a funny thing, and I'm going to finish with this. When he was home, he liked ball games, never been to a ball game in his life, but he loved to follow sports. He loved Cincinnati Reds. He liked Joe Lewis boxing. And my brother was in high school, and he was calling the high school games. My dad would lean over against this little table radio. He would lean to one side, listening to my brother calling the ball game. 
at the same time, this is when we got a television, he would watch the Cincinnati Reds playing their game. In his lap was his Bible and a quarterly. He was preparing his Sunday school lesson. Three things he's doing at one time. You could ask him a question about any one of the three and he could answer. I always knew the answer. My son was a little boy and they would watch the Cincinnati Red with game because my son was eight years old and he'd sit on the couch with my dad and they would watch the Cincinnati Red. And when we got home, my son would say, you know, Papa knows everything about those players. He, know, he can tell you anything you want to know about those ball players. He had a good memory, smart man, a good man. He was my daddy. He was rough on us kids though. He never, he never whipped us, but mama would threaten us while your daddy takes his belt to you. And every time we saw daddy unbuckling his belt, and this usually right after supper, he'd be sitting in the chair, he'd start to unbuckle his belt and we would look and we'd look at each other and think, which one of us is gonna get it this time? Daddy was gonna use his belt. Scared us all. We were ready to run to the bedroom, crawl under the bed, because we didn't know which one had done something. Daddy was unbuckling his belt, headed for the bathroom. And we always laughed later about that, how we always jumped and ran, because whichever one of us had done something, we were in trouble. Yeah. I don't know much more you'd want to know about my dad. I just was always so sorry for him because he never could tell us about his family. He didn't know things about his family because they had all moved to Texas and to Oklahoma and Missouri when he was a kid. And he became a man at the age of 14. So that's the major things I can tell you about my dad. Simple things. He wasn't anybody important except to his family. He died of cancer, cancer of the pancreas at the age of 80. The week he died or the week before he died, I took off work for a week to came and do my turn at the nursing home, sitting with him day and night. And he would, he was in such pain. And he would say, sis, you go on home. I'll be all right. And I would say, daddy, I can sleep right here in this chair. I said, it won't take me two minutes to go to sleep. And we, this was true because I had a sleep problem anyway but I'd say, I can sleep right here in this chair. But he'd say, you go on home. I'll be all right. Two days after I left, he died. So I hope you enjoy your Father's Day with your fathers and be good to them. Thank you.